lecture seven of lectures on painting by edward armitage this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture seven color lectures on color are generally semi-scientific discourses the lecturer explains the theory of primaries and secondaries and the optical effects produced by contrast illustrating what he has got to say on the subject by means of colored diagrams those who are interested in the singular effect produced by what are called simultaneous and successive contrasts of color had better consult chevreuil's book on color which has been translated into english and is a very exhaustive work on the subject from a very slight knowledge of the book i should say that it was more likely to be of use to the designer and manufacturer than to the artist the author deals almost entirely with flat surfaces of color and the weakest part of the book is that where he tackles the complex problem of reducing to rule the coloring of pictures some of his theories appear to me very fanciful and some are quite contrary to my own experience indeed it is a question to me whether a scientific knowledge of optics in their relation to color can be of any use to an artist in his profession after this preamble you will not be surprised if i do not exhibit to-night any prisms or kaleidoscopic effects of color moreover i don't know enough of the subject to venture to lecture on it i shall give you the results of my experiences a quantum valiant not only about colors but about such prosaic matters as brushes palettes and mediums it appears to me that many a student is kept back or discouraged because his palette is in a hopeless mess his brushes are like old birch brooms and his canvas is slippery and greasy if you were learning to write instead of learning to paint you would not provide yourselves with stumpy worn-out pens bad ink and cartridge paper you would get fairly good pens and ink and white foolscap so as to give yourselves a chance i don't wish you to be fastidious about the choice of your materials this is as bad as being too careless nor do i want to bind you to use the colors and brushes which i myself find most convenient for life studies all i desire is that you should not multiply your difficulties unnecessarily by using bad materials before however entering on these details i wish to make a few observations about the effect and contrast of colors in the first place i would observe that pictorially speaking no color can taken individually be called either pretty or ugly the dullest mud color if in its right place is charming and the most delicate mauve if in the wrong place hideous dirt has been defined as matter in the wrong place no one while digging among his flower-beds will call the rich mould dirt but if he proceeds to wipe his spade with his pocket-handkerchief he will certainly dirty it in the same way when in a picture we speak of a colour being ugly or dirty all we mean is that it appears so with reference to its surroundings take the same colour and put it in a more harmonious setting and it will appear all right we are told by scientific writers on colour that the primaries red yellow and blue harmonize with their secondaries viz red with green yellow with purple and blue with orange this is no doubt true in a general way but it is by no means invariably true any colour will under certain conditions harmonize with any other provided they are of the proper shade and the surrounding setting and background are suitable whilst on the other hand we often see in pictures by bad colourists the most orthodox combination of reds and greens which instead of being harmonious are painfully discordant the truth is that colour cannot be subjected to theoretical rules the only safe book for the student to consult is the book of nature he will there find no limit to the harmonious combinations of the primary and secondary colours do the golden blossoms of the ragwort or the bluebells of the wild hyacinth not harmonize with their respective green leaves are the orange orchards of the south or the mingled blue green and gold of the peacock's plumage unpleasant to the eye and yet these combinations of colour violate the rules laid down by theorists another obvious truth to be gleaned from nature and which may be made applicable to art is that she varies her tints according to climate in the plumage and colouring of exotic birds and insects we find the most gorgeous combinations of bright colours 
in the parrot house of the zoological gardens we see red and blue orange and purple blue and green plumages of the most brilliant hues the colouring of these birds although not as discordant as their voices seems in our grey climate too crude and violent but in their native tropical forests with an intensely blue sky overhead the crudity would disappear and they would be as much in keeping with the surrounding scenery as eagles and hawks are on our mountains black and white sea-fowl on our coasts or sparrows in our streets the truth appears to be that in colour there are various scales of intensity and strength if the keynote or in other words the most decided colour in your picture be strong and vivid you will have to carry out the whole picture on the same scale if it be of a delicate or neutral tint you must treat the remainder of the picture accordingly good specimens of old stained-glass windows where the strongest reds blues greens and yellows are seen in juxtaposition are fine examples of a powerful rich harmony of colour and many pictures of the dutch school are very good illustrations of harmony of a delicate grey kind this sort of low-toned harmony is much more easily obtained than the stronger and richer kind the reason for this is that faults of colour and errors of taste are much less conspicuous in a grey picture than in a brilliantly coloured one in the former all the costumes are of a whitey brown buff or slate colour and an injudicious distribution of these quaker-like tints would be hardly noticeable but in a work where strong reds yellows blues and blacks predominate the substitution of one colour for another would be fatal to the picture in landscape again it is far easier to paint the grey land of mountain and mist than the brilliant sunshine of the south any one who honestly attempts to depict the blue mediterranean sparkling in the sunshine will probably be severely criticised whilst his neighbour who has painted the kind of highland scenery we all know so well will get praised for his painstaking truthfulness although his picture may in every respect be inferior as a transcript of nature to the southern one the axiom to be derived from this is that whatever your subject may be whether figures or landscape it is comparatively easy to succeed as a colourist in a low or grey scale of colour i do not mean to recommend any shirking of difficulties and if your subject is of a nature which requires brilliant colouring by all means endeavour to paint it up to the mark but in decorative work and in pictures which admit of a tender and soft colouring you will do well to select greys bluish greens and broken tints generally your shortcomings will be less conspicuous and you will avoid the risk of becoming tawdry and vulgar some men are born with a strong natural feeling for colour and a good many more fancy they have this gift without really possessing it some have an exceptionally dull sense for colour and although they may be quite able to distinguish red from green yet they cannot be taught to discriminate between different shades of the same colour to students belonging to any of these three classes i am afraid my lecture will be of no use the first that is the born colourists will instinctively use harmonious tints and their natural feelings will be a better guide to them than any lectures the second class namely those who fondly believe themselves to be colourists will of course not attend to anything i may say and those to whom nature has denied a sense of colour are unteachable just as it is hopeless to teach music to a man who has no ear the great majority however of students belong to none of these exceptional classes they have an average sense of colour just as they have an average sense of form and although i am quite aware that practice and experience will alone improve and develop their power of colouring yet a few practical hints may facilitate and shorten their studies i assume that whatever method is adopted for painting flesh the object ought to be to get it like nature i don't mean necessarily like the model but like what nature would be under the conditions imposed by the subject and it is very necessary continually to bear in mind what those conditions are it will not do if you have an open-air subject to paint to copy your model faithfully as he appears in the studio and then put in a sky and background from your out-of-door studies although the whole picture might truly be said to be painted from nature yet it would certainly not look right the figures would have been painted under one condition of light 
and the landscape under another you cannot be expected except under peculiar circumstances to paint direct from your model out of doors but you may take careful notice of the difference between studio light and shade and open air effect i must do modern painters the justice to say that this difference is much more generally recognized than it was twenty years ago formerly a group of figures used to be painted with more or less care from models as they appeared in the studio the aperture which admitted light being often not more than three or four feet wide it was immaterial to the artist whether the scene of his subject was an apartment similarly lighted or an open heath and the consequence was that the picture however cleverly it might be painted had an unreal appearance whenever a landscape background was introduced this discrepancy must have been felt and hence no doubt we may account for the perfectly conventional landscape backgrounds we notice in many pictures by the masters of the last century instead of the old artifice of spoiling the landscape for the sake of the figures it is much better and healthier art to paint the figures to suit the landscape we cannot do this completely unless we paint the whole picture on the spot and then we should not have the same command over the arrangement of the groups as we have in the studio but we can make an approximation toward this desirable end and it is satisfactory to notice that many young artists both french and english are making efforts in this direction and thus studying the ever varying effects of colour and light in the only way in which they ought to be studied if you do not feel equal to the task of thus modifying your studio work choose some subject where the scene is an interior analogous to your own room and then you may copy literally the colour and light and shade of your models and draperies i am not going to give any recipe for painting flesh some english artists and the great majority of foreigners paint it in at once as near nature as they can others model it first in what is technically called dead colour and finish with transparent or semi-transparent tints if the result is good it matters little how it has been attained every artist has his own method and he generally adheres to it either because he is accustomed to it or because it suits his style of composition and drawing i shall therefore confine the remarks i have to make on colour to the harmonious arrangement of backgrounds draperies and costumes first as to backgrounds it is a curious fact which any one can verify that if you have painted a head and you find the colour too hot and red the proper remedy is to paint the background of a cool green or some cold colour naturally one would suppose that on the principle of contrast the cool coloured background would make the head appear redder such however is certainly not the case a vermilion curtain behind your rubicund gentleman would make him appear more objectionably rubicund but a cool grey or green would have the contrary effect on the other hand if you want warmth of colour in your head paint a red background to it if you try to give warmth to it by setting it in a cold background you will make it look more ghastly than it did the only explanation i can offer for this apparent anomaly is that the eye gets filled or saturated with the colour of the background until the head seems to partake of it in the first example the eye gets filled with cool green and thus the redness of the head becomes less apparent in the second example the optic nerves get accustomed to a hot colour and so the pallor of the head disappears in my opinion a coloured sketch or water-colour drawing gains brilliancy by being mounted on a white background whereas according to theory the dazzling whiteness of the mount ought to make the drawing look dingy in the same way supposing you have painted a series of figures for the decoration of a pediment or frieze and you find that your figures are dull and heavy in colour how are you to remedy this without repainting them my answer would be give them a gold or light bright coloured background it is not only that this bright background enlivens the whole work but it has the effect of making each individual figure appear less dull in colour although experience has taught me that these apparently anomalous effects are produced with colour yet of course where black and white alone are concerned the law of contrast follows its natural course 
that is if you want to give brilliancy to a white spot surround it with black and if you want to give darkness to a black spot surround it with white in a composition of several figures it is almost always desirable to assist the effect by selecting white or light-coloured draperies for the figures in the light and dark colours for the figures in the shade this principle may of course be carried too far but as a general rule it may be depended on a good deal has been said by sir j reynolds and others in praise of a simple palette and with much of this i cordially agree still i think that in the ordinary practice of figure painting nine or ten colours are indispensable if i give you my own palette it is not that i wish to dictate to you what colours to employ but simply as a foundation for the remarks i am going to make about the colours generally used first with regard to white white lead is the pigment all but universally used in oil painting many years ago i tried zinc white it was strongly recommended on the ground that it did not turn yellow or black with age like white lead i believe it has this good quality but it wants opacity and body and although i think it might be used with great advantage in skies and for scrumbling i don't think it can ever replace white lead for flesh painting we next come to naples yellow i am no chemist and do not profess to tell you what naples yellow is made of any more than i could inform you of what london butter is made there are a great many shades of this useful colour but i think that the pale greenish variety is the most serviceable the french have jaune de naples ordinaire jaune brillant and three shades of jaune pignard our colourmen have pale and deep naples yellow of various shades and lemon yellow besides of all these varieties i prefer the light-coloured jaune pignard in painting flesh it will be found useful especially in the reflected light of the shadows where white lead would probably create heaviness and opacity but it is in light-coloured draperies in gold-embroidered brocades and in glowing sunsets that naples yellow of some kind becomes indispensable yellow ochre ought to be a simple earth-tinted yellow in nature's laboratory but like the aforesaid naples yellow you cannot tell what the contents of the tube you purchase as yellow ochre really are the terracciara which in italian fresco replaces our yellow ochre is perfectly durable but no yellow ochre that i ever bought in london could resist the action of the lime hence i conclude that the yellow ochre of the trade is not a genuine earth however that may be it is quite indispensable on the palette and in oil painting seems perfectly durable roman ochre golden ochre and other varieties are quite unnecessary if you have yellow ochre on your palette but brown ochre is capital for one particular purpose and for nothing else that i know of the purpose of which i am speaking is for painting a dead white luminous bit of wall or pavement if you mellow your white lead with a very little brown ochre you will get a luminous compound which is neither yellow nor red and is totally dissimilar to your flesh tint of raw sienna i would speak with great respect as it is perfectly durable in fresco work where yellow ochre drops off the wall and disintegrates everything it is mixed with nevertheless raw sienna wants body when ground in oil and except perhaps for landscape painting i hardly ever use it before exhausting the yellows i may mention that the only violent yellow you ought ever to admit on your palette is cadmium chromes of all kinds are rank poison and cadmium though quite safe is a difficult colour to manage with discretion light red is burnt ochre and is one of the most useful colours of the palette for painting flesh mixed with white and a very little yellow it is the foundation of all flesh painting the french light red or brun rouge as it is called is much better than ours it is a little more pink in colour and is generally pleasanter to work with we now come to vermilion of this colour there are two kinds in common use the chinese and the so-called extract of vermilion i should think it hardly necessary to have both kinds on the palette 
but some artists who are much better colorists than i can pretend to be think otherwise and although they omit altogether umbers and browns of all sorts yet never lay their palette without both sorts of vermilion burnt sienna is the next color on our palette and is of universal use it is the best color to use for giving warmth to shades and for preparing draperies or stuffs which are ultimately to be blue or green of course one may use it too much but it never gives opacity and heaviness which any other red would do if employed for a similar purpose there are many other reds venetian red is hardly to be distinguished from light red indian red is a deep lakey red and very opaque i don't think it is much used now but formerly it was in great request for painting flesh etty was very fond of it the so-called mars reds are perfectly durable but all these colors are quite unnecessary of the lakes the most useful for general purpose is madder lake some of them such as yellow lake and scarlet lake are very fugitive and not safe to use rose matter and purple matter are expensive and except for very rich stuffs are seldom wanted there are several varieties of brown and yellow matters which may be used with advantage in landscape but which are never really wanted for figure painting green is a color which is not absolutely necessary if you have blue on the palette still it is sometimes very useful for the half-tones oxide of chromium is the best of the decided greens but i think that the french vert de cobalt is more generally useful this is a bluish green and a most excellent color for painting skies terre verte has no body in it and i find it turns black very speedily malachite green is a sickly color that i cannot recommend and what we used to call emerald green but which the french call vert veronese is rank poison on the palette almost all the rich dark greens required for foliage and verdure in landscape painting can be obtained by a judicious mixture of blues and yellows french ultramarine mixed with raw or burnt sienna gives a strong dark green which is not at all heavy and every landscape painter discovers new combinations of blues and blacks with yellows and reds which enable him to give the infinite variety of nature as for blues the only colors i can recommend are cobalt and french ultramarine the colors known as ultramarine ash and mineral gray are sometimes useful but they can very easily be imitated on the palette i never use either prussian antwerp or any other cyanus blue and i think that at any rate for figure painting they are unnecessary you will observe that i have not put any browns on the palette not even umber i am quite aware that with many painters especially english ones raw umber is considered a sine qua non and i thought so myself a few years ago i took however a dislike to it from a conviction that it turned black and i fancy that i have done better since i discarded it it is very seldom seen on the palettes of foreign artists asphaltum and bitumen are very seductive colors but as every one knows they have been the ruin of many excellent pictures and it is well to steer clear of them i think however that either color when mixed with white lead is tolerably safe and nothing else that i know of gives so effectively and pleasantly the gray hair and fur of animals in blacks you have ivory or blue-black both excellent colors and there is also a charcoal black which is much more gray than either of the others and has very little body i think when mixed with white that it may be useful in painting clouds it is generally gritty and badly ground but for the purpose i mention i don't think this fault matters much before taking leave of the palette i may be expected to say something about brushes and mediums first as to brushes as to the size of the brushes this depends very much on the taste and habits of the artist i am fond of small ones myself not necessarily sables but small hog's hair tools and i should recommend them to beginners who wish to express form as well as colour in their work i never use flat brushes for painting flesh and very seldom for anything else but this is merely an old habit 
every one is perfectly right to use the tools which he finds the most convenient only let them be good of their kind and always kept in working order now as to mediums this is a subject on which i speak with diffidence as opinions vary greatly about these compounds i think however that i may safely say that the less they are used by students the better by mediums i mean the various copal jellies which are sold in tubes and placed on the palette like the colours i do not say that they are unsafe to use in moderation but moderation is said by teetotalers to be a virtue more difficult to practise than total abstinence for a great many years i used them and have only quite lately discarded them altogether in favour of clarified poppy oil this oil is a very slow dryer and is therefore peculiarly suitable for academy students work it continually happens that a student prepares a larger portion of the figure than he can finish in one day the next day it is too dry to continue the modelling and yet not dry enough for glazing and repainting if he has painted it with poppy oil he will find it in a very workable state for two or even three days nothing can be safer provided of course the picture is painted throughout with the same slow dryer the best and purest poppy oil is known by the name of huile chromophile it has a strong smell of castor oil which to susceptible persons may be rather an objection i shall not attempt a criticism of the various oils and essences which are to be found at the colourman's what is one man's meat is another man's poison and i even go farther and say that the same man in one period of his career will swear by some compound which a few years afterward he will regard with special aversion the only advice i give to young artists is to use the simplest materials they can both for mediums and colours and i may add that the better the colourist the simpler his palette generally is i have seen on some foreign artists palettes as many as six different kinds of lake when one would have been quite sufficient and i need hardly say that whatever other merit their pictures may have had they were not distinguished for brilliant colour after all it is only natural that it should be so an artist who is not a good colourist must unless he is blinded by conceit have some suspicion of his deficiency and would naturally endeavour by a more elaborate palette to remedy his shortcomings just as some of our bad cooks endeavour to improve their cuisine by a liberal use of made sauces with artists as with cooks the remedy is unsuccessful in both cases it is taste that is wanted and not a multiplicity of ingredients if a student has a germ of feeling for colour he may develop it into a plant of respectable growth he will probably never become a great colourist but he may at any rate learn to attain a certain degree of harmony and propriety qualities which are not always found in the works of noted colourists i would strongly deprecate the habit of painting pictures up to exhibition pitch paint them up to the pitch you see in nature and you will have quite enough to do exasperation is not force and although a soberly coloured work may be eclipsed on the exhibition walls by a dazzling neighbour yet it will more than hold its own when removed from the glare and glitter of its surroundings colour as understood by many people means violent contrasts of reds blues and yellows now i am far from saying that strong contrasts and positive colours are always inharmonious we have even in our climate plenty of wild flowers to prove the contrary the scarlet poppy the blue cornflower the common yellow buttercup are all as positive in colour as red blue and yellow well can be but the green stalk and leaves of each plant harmonise perfectly with the flower and the contrast though strong is never offensive the kind of contrasts i am deprecating are perhaps best known by the epithet vulgar look at the cheap coloured glass windows which abound in our country churches and which are generally much admired by the congregation as a rule the more crude the colours the more grateful are the farmers and their wives to the donors of these windows for giving them something cheerful to look at during the service we need not go into the country for specimens of vulgar taste in colour 
i never pass a london pillar letter-box without an uncomfortable feeling particularly after it has been newly painted the post-office authorities are certainly not bound to educate the eye of the british public and their object in painting these post-boxes vermilion was of course to make them more conspicuous just as a red flag is used to indicate danger but the daily press and particularly that sheet which claims the largest circulation in the world praise the authorities for giving us a bit of colour to refresh the eye had these letter-boxes been painted in a lakey indian red or of a bronze colour they would have been unobjectionable but no one would have thought of commending them as bits of colour again if we consider the scheme of clothing the volunteer regiments in scarlet and try to account for the enthusiasm with which certain corps have hailed the innovation we shall find that the bit of colour is at the bottom of it it can hardly be supposed that the gallant east end volunteers wish to be mistaken for militiamen it must be that the scarlet cloth is thought becoming both by themselves and their female relatives if i am not mistaken the west end corps such as the queens the ends of court and especially the artists will be very loath to give up their grey uniforms and don the national red i am afraid that the average englishman's taste in colour though much improved of late years is still but little more refined than the west africans if he no longer buys hideous wallpapers and vulgar carpets it is not that he dislikes them but that he does not know where to get them so great has been the improvement in our manufactures if we turn from the english philistine to the english artist we find ourselves at the opposite pole he has often such a horror of loud vulgar tints that he is apt to fall into the affectation of painting on too subdued a scale and i would caution you against such affectation truth is not necessarily dull nor is simplicity monochromatic there is no danger of the general public which delights in the red coats of our soldiers and thinks the crudest coloured dyes the prettiest encouraging you to paint sad olive pictures the danger comes from the select few who are gifted with aesthetic taste and who having recently awakened to the fact that crude contrasts do not constitute colour fall into the opposite extreme and praise whatever is negative and colourless the dismal view of nature seems to me an unhealthy view and although it may be commended as a reaction against vulgar tawdry colour the art which it tends to foster is morbid and unsound beauty of colour is a much more subtle and indefinable quality than beauty of form we are all pretty well agreed that the antique is the nearest approach to perfection of form which has ever been made but we are by no means agreed about colour some will think that titian was the greatest colourist that ever lived some velasquez some paul veronese and some rembrandt and it is not only individual opinions that differ but the collective opinion of the age we all are familiar with instances of pictures which are now highly prized for their colour but which within the present century fail to gain admission to any exhibition delacroix's pictures used to be regularly rejected or very badly hung and these same pictures are now considered the gems of the gallery at versailles on our side of the channel we used to turn out muller's and i believe constable's pictures these acts of what we should call injustice were not committed from any academic spite or jealousy they were simply the expression of the general public opinion at that time it may be noted that our predecessors in this country were by no means indifferent to colour on the contrary they prided themselves on being the creme de la creme of colourists and any one who expressed admiration for the colour of gros and Guéricault would be looked upon as a kind of traitor to the english school it was a generally accepted article of belief in england that the french could draw but knew nothing about colour and that for fine colouring you must look at home we have less national prejudice now and i hope that we are in a better path toward forming a right judgment than our predecessors were they almost always judged of the colour of a picture by comparing it with similar works by the old masters and if it reminded them of titian correggio rubens or some other acknowledged colourist it was pronounced a fine thing 
if it were unlike the work of any accepted master of colour it was thought nothing of however true it might be to nature hence as constable's pictures resembled neither claude Kirp, nor risedale they were disliked by the connoisseurs of the period and were quite unsaleable a remnant of this artificial way of judging pictures still lingers amongst us but speaking generally the present generation has ceased to take this narrow view of colour mistakes in judgment are no doubt made and posterity may pronounce a different verdict on some of our favourites still the principle on which we decide whether a man is to be called a colourist or not is sound the principle is briefly this that however unusual or novel the colouring of a picture may be if it reminds one vividly of some harmony of nature if there is space and air in it and if the same atmosphere pervades the whole canvas it is the work of a real colourist i have abstained in this lecture from giving you any of the old-fashioned recipes for colouring such as keeping the shades warm and light cool and vice versa because i think that all such rules have a tendency to cramp and fetter the artist who follows them nothing can be more dissimilar than the works of the florentine girlandero and the portraits of rembrandt and yet few will deny the right of both these painters to rank as colourists i might bracket titian with rubens or correggio with ostad to show how broad is the path which leads to excellence in colour an innate sense of the harmonious colour in nature and a steadfast determination by hook or by crook to reproduce an echo of this harmony on your canvas must ultimately lead to a good result no original colourist could tell you by what process he arrives at the effect he obtains his only secret if secret it be is that he observes more closely and intelligently than other men it is not the colours he uses nor the canvas nor the medium nor even the technical skill of his hand which causes his picture to look like nature whilst his neighbour's looks like paint it is simply what phrenologists would call his bump of colour but what i who do not believe in bumps would term his keen appreciation of the harmony of nature and his retentive memory which enables him to reproduce in his studio the fleeting effects he has seen i cannot promise you that by adopting the same method you will all become great colourists but of this you may rest assured that habits of observation and repeated attempts at rendering honestly and faithfully what you have seen will tend to improve your colour far more than all the rules that have ever been laid down and all the lectures that have ever been delivered End of lecture seven. Lecture 8 of Lectures on Painting by Edward Armitage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 8 on Decorative Painting. By decorative painting, I mean moral figure painting. Ornamental designs are a very important factor in all decorative work, but as this branch of the art is out of my province, I shall say nothing about it the great mistake most artists make when they have a large wall space to decorate with figures is to proceed in the same way as they would for an easel picture elaborate finish powerful light and shade expression and individuality in the heads are all excellent qualities in an easel picture but they are by no means necessary in decorative work on the other hand a well-balanced and harmonious composition a pure and grand style of drawing and great breadth and luminosity of colouring are absolutely essential for good decorative work these are all qualities which are never got by dexterity of hand dodges about colour or chance to which much of the fascination of oil painting on canvas must be attributed they are only attainable by patient and laborious work I will endeavour to show you step by step what the nature of this work is. It is always advisable for decorative work of any importance to make a cartoon of the size of the painting, and if possible, after the completion of the cartoon, to have it put up in situ, so that the size of the figures, the arrangement of the groups, and the general effect may be judged of. If the result is satisfactory, the work may be considered three parts done should there however be any alterations required they should be carried out on the cartoon 
nothing which requires alteration should be left knowingly there will always be plenty of unforeseen changes suggesting themselves during the progress of the painting without complicating matters by having an imperfect cartoon for fresco painting a cartoon is absolutely necessary in the course of this lecture i will describe the process of fresco painting before however proceeding to speak of the different methods of painting we will first consider the preliminary operations the first thing to be done even before a stroke of charcoal sullies the spotless purity of our cartoon paper is to get an idea of the kind of arrangement which it will be best to adopt this pursuit of an idea for the general arrangement of our subject is of course entirely brain work but as soon as an idea is got the hand comes into play not however with charcoal on the big cartoon but with pen and ink or pencil in the scrapbook i always think the clearest way of describing any process is to take an example we will therefore take an example and suppose that we are lucky enough to have the decoration of a town hall or some similar building in a large seaport town entrusted to us and that it has been suggested to us by our employers that groups of figures representing all countries would be appropriate very well we don't at once seize a stick of charcoal and begin drawing promiscuously we think first how we can best fit our subject into the space allotted to us how are we to arrange our personages shall we group them irrespective of their nationality like the figures in de la roche's hemicycle or shall we adopt a kind of geographical arrangement shall we have a centre figure or group shall we introduce architecture into the background as raphael has done in the school of athens these and a dozen other questions of vital importance to our design have all to be settled before the cartoon is begun and we must be guided in our settlement very much by the nature of the building the shape of the panel the height of the work from the ground etc the decorative painter ought always to bear in mind that his work is supplementary to that of the architect in attention to this self-evident truism has been the cause of many failures in an easel picture we order the frame to suit the picture we don't paint the picture to suit the frame but in mural painting the reverse ought always to be the rule of course there are cases as for instance in museums and picture galleries where the works of art are the jewel and the building the setting but these works of art are not decorative the very word decorative implies subserviency to that which has to be decorated to return to our imaginary work i will suppose we have decided that a central group of figures is desirable and that england as the greatest maritime power in the world ought to occupy the place of honour moreover not being of the parish indian school we think that she ought to be supported by her colonies we will therefore surround her with figures representing canada india australia etc having so far settled our scheme of composition we must abandon our idea of a geographical arrangement we find that it is more logical to arrange our figures according to the importance of the countries they represent than according to their latitude and longitude we will accordingly place in the immediate vicinity of our central group representatives of france the united states germany italy etc we then gradually descend to less civilized countries until finally we reach the remote corners which we reserve for barbarians like our late enemy king coffee the next point for our consideration would be how are we to represent england certainly not as a pseudo-classical minerva with a trident in her hand and the british lion at her feet still less as an obese ill-tempered john bull we may leave this venerable joke to the comic press we must try and invent something new which shall be characteristic of england and yet neither commonplace nor grotesque we may however leave the costume and action of our britannia for future consideration we have made up our minds that britannia must be typified by a female figure but farther than this we need not go at present having got the keynote as it may be called of the composition we shall have no difficulty in determining that all the other civilized countries must also be represented by female figures it will not probably be advisable to clothe these figures in their respective national costumes such a mode of treatment would be incompatible with a grand style of decoration 
it will nevertheless be quite allowable to vary their features and complexion according to the nationality they represent and to give them something either flowers fruit grain or produce which will help to identify them having got thus far we may begin to map out our groups on the cartoon we do not engage models until we have approximately decided on the various attitudes we wish our figures to assume some must be standing some sitting and very possibly some kneeling or reclining we try these various attitudes on the cartoon sketching them in very lightly with soft charcoal we transfer and shift them about until we get an harmonious and pleasant arrangement of line not too symmetrical and yet sufficiently so to give an air of grandeur and repose to the work these figures need not of course be more than indicated but they ought to be tolerably correct in proportion and the attitude should be natural or at any rate possible it is here that a knowledge of anatomy is especially useful to the young artist when a man has been drawing figures for forty years he ought to draw the human form very much as he forms the letters of the alphabet when writing but until long experience has given him this kind of facility he will find his studies of anatomy and proportion of the greatest benefit to him he will save many a long and profitless morning's work from a model and save his pocket too it is when the cartoon is in this state of progress that is when the size of the figures the general arrangement of the different groups and their relative position have been settled approximately that it is so desirable to hoist it up to its place on the wall any alteration can be made now much easier than later certain figures or even whole groups may want to be shifted a few inches certain actions modified the line of heads may require revisal and so on and it is obvious that what can be done now with a few lines of charcoal would at a later period involve a great amount of rubbing out and a great waste of labour having at last decided on the proportions and positions of the various groups and single figures we may now begin to work from the living model and here it may perhaps not be out of place if i give you some advice about the selection of your models i would strongly advise you to engage those who are intelligent and apt rather than those who may be better proportioned but who are stiff and awkward what you want in the present stage of your work is natural and graceful action and with some models it is hopeless to struggle in this direction when i was a student in paris there were some three or four models who were so intelligent and i may say so artistic that they naturally put themselves into the attitudes wanted and even suggested and assumed other positions which were often adopted by the artist in violent and spontaneous action suitable for battle pictures these models were invaluable and the decline of many a great reputation in historical painting dates from the death of these humble assistants some of whom could neither read nor write i am afraid the race is extinct but even in the present generations of models some are far superior in artistic feeling to others in our present cartoon however we do not require any violent action all we need is perfect ease and dignity as our personages are to be clothed it will be unnecessary to make careful nude studies nevertheless it will be well to get rough outline drawings from the nude of all the figures just to correct and verify the proportions of our personages two or three of these nude studies can be made in a day if the artist is an experienced draughtsman there may not be much to correct on the large cartoon but let him be ever so experienced there is always something wrong about the attitude of figures drawn without models and occasionally very gross mistakes are made i knew a very clever draughtsman in paris who made the mistake of giving one of his figures two right hands and he did not find it out until he began to work from nature in an outstretched arm the twist of the radius and ulna makes all the difference about the position of the thumb and if the thumb be placed on the wrong side of the hand you immediately make a right hand of what ought to be a left and vice versa i will assume now that we have corrected the drawing of our cartoon from our small nude studies we are fully aware that the drawing of every figure will have to be perfected from nature that is the head neck arms hands and feet 
but we are satisfied that the attitudes are all possible and that there is no great fault in the proportions now therefore we may look out for models for the heads arms feet etc and work with chalk or charcoal if it can be fixed on the cartoon itself and here let me caution you against ever working from a model whom you know to be unsuitable if as often happens you engage a model and find when you have got him into position that he won't do pay him his sitting and send him away it is better to lose five shillings than to lose five shillings and your morning's work into the bargain at this stage of progress we ought to be draping our figures as well as drawing the heads and hands whatever may be said about small easel pictures i am quite sure that for large mural work a lay figure is indispensable in adjusting draperies on a lay figure a good deal of ingenuity and above all a good deal of patience are necessary nothing is so stupid as a lay figure and many artists prefer studying their draperies on the living model but the studies thus done will very seldom have the precision and finish of those done from the lay figure they are therefore less suitable for large cartoon work i will now suppose that all our figures are draped and the heads and hands finished there still remains the selection of the different symbols or attributes which are to give nationality to our personages and here we must endeavour to reconcile truth with pictorial fitness we have the whole vegetable and animal kingdom to choose from and it will go hard if we cannot fit each female figure with some flower fruit bird or beast which shall be typical of the country she represents and at the same time ornamental and graceful the cartoon is now at last finished and the next thing to be done is to make a coloured sketch i need not go through this process at length every one knows that the scheme of colour intended at first is often abandoned and minor changes are innumerable at last however we get what we think a good result and all our preliminary work is over not quite however for we have to trace the cartoon on transparent paper and prick the tracing some artists omit the tedious process of pricking the tracing but the labour that is thus saved is fully counterbalanced by the trouble of following all the lines of the tracing with a point before an impression can be got whereas with a pricked tracing a bag of pounded charcoal does the work at once i will now give a short account of the different mediums principally in use for mural painting the first medium i shall notice is oil or some modification of oil the great objection to oil for mural work is the impossibility of seeing the painting when it faces the light an absorbent ground will to a certain extent mitigate this evil the use of spirits of turpentine benzene and other essences will also contribute toward giving a flat surface but do what we will we can never get in an oil painting the pure clear qualities of watercolour or fresco the compound known as paris's medium and sold by roberson is not a bad thing for diminishing the shine of oil painting it is made of white wax dissolved in spirits of lavender but i am inclined to think that an absorbent ground prepared with parchment size and whiting is the best preventive of the greasy surface inseparable from oil painting the great desideratum in all mural and decorative oil painting is that every part should have an equal amount of shine take an ordinary oil picture and place it opposite the light the lighter parts will be tolerably well seen but the oily or gummy darks will reflect the light of the sky and spoil the effect completely all we can aspire to in decorative oil painting is to give to the dark parts as little shine as there is in the light ones where white lead and opaque colours generally have been freely used i cannot say as much in favour of wax as a medium for grinding the colours in it is neither fish flesh nor good red herring that is it has neither the richness of oil nor the luminosity of fresco most of the modern decorative pictures in the parish churches are painted with this medium the colours are much the same as for oil painting but the blacks browns and lakes have a very dull appearance the fluid medium used for painting is a kind of essential oil of lavender so that this method if somewhat deficient in light is at any rate overflowing with sweetness 
i have found that to use the ordinary oil colors diluted with a medium composed of wax mastic varnish and turpentine is by far preferable to legitimate wax painting the colors are much more manageable and dry brighter without having any more shine than when actually ground with wax what is called encaustic painting has also wax as a foundation but is quite a different process to peinture à la cire encaustic implies burning and in this method of painting the colors are laid on rather thick and when the work or any portion of it has to be finished a hot iron is applied to melt the wax and allow the brush to do its softening and finishing work the pompeii paintings are mostly done in this way but it is very unfitted for large figure painting distemper has many excellent qualities but its want of durability will always prevent its being used for costly and important work it might however be made much more durable than it generally is by a careful selection of materials distemper is generally associated with scene painting or some temporary work for which any rubbish can be used but if care were taken about the size and the colors and above all if some coating of silica were floated over the finished painting to protect it from damp and atmospheric changes i see no reason why this very pleasant method should not be generally used the so-called silica method has been much used in germany under the name of wasserglas i have no experience in this method and therefore cannot enter into detail speaking generally the process consists in painting on a dry surface with colors simply ground in water and fixing the colors afterward by the spray of silicated water i believe that after this silication the work can be retouched and even repainted subject however to another fixing by silication we now come to the best and grandest style of decorative work namely legitimate fresco people who don't know much about painting are very apt to call any picture on a wall or fresco but i suppose i need hardly tell you that oil or wax paintings on walls are no more frescoes than is an oil sketch on paper a watercolor in all the methods of painting i have mentioned some medium is used to fix the color it is either oil copal wax size or silica but in fresco no vehicle of any kind except water is used how then is the color fixed how have michelangelo's and even giotto's frescoes lasted to the present day we all know that if some powdered color is mixed with water and applied by a brush to a wall it will stick as long as it is wet but as soon as the water evaporates the color returns to the powder it was before and falls off or brushes off with the slightest friction the reason that frescoes can be dusted and washed without effacing the color is that they were originally painted on wet mortar and the lime of which the mortar is composed has the property of retaining and fixing the color i will now describe the whole process of fresco painting the first care ought to be the wall a brick wall is the best but stone will do very well provided every precaution has been taken against damp on this wall there ought to be a coating of strong rough mortar about half an inch thick the surface ought not to be smoothed with the trowel but left rather uneven as soon as this mortar is thoroughly dry the fresco may be begun i have already told you that all real fresco is painted on wet mortar but the mortar or intonaco as the italians call it is not the rough stuff which has already been used for coating the wall the composition of this intonaco is all-important and i am perfectly convinced that the rapid decay of our modern frescoes is due entirely to the bad quality of the intonaco the lime should be thoroughly slaked so as to deprive it of its caustic properties but it does not follow that it should be twenty or thirty years old lime can be kept in a slaked state and skimmed until it almost ceases to be lime at all and this worn-out material is unfit for fresco then the sand should be gritty and hard to the touch clean river sand collected in a granite country is very good ground lava is used by modern italian fresco painters i do not know where the sand supplied to the fresco painters of westminster palace came from but it was a great deal too fine and soft to the touch 
the older and more worn out the lime is the sharper and more tenacious ought to be the sand having got some well slaked but not worn out lime and some good hard sand the mortar that is required for the day's use should be made fresh every day or at least as often as twice a week when i was painting some frescoes at islington i got my intonaco from a man who had had great experience instead however of sending me the lime and sand separate he sent me about twenty small barrels of ready-made mortar my work took me nearly two years and every morning my plasterer had to go with a pickaxe and hack a piece of dry mortar out of the barrels this he beat up with water and spread it for my day's work smacking his lips as if he had got a most delicious compound on his trowel i knew no better then but now i am surprised not that the fresco should be decaying but that the decay should not be more rapid improper colours and the omnipresent gas may have had something to do with the decay of all frescoes painted in london but from experience i can assert with confidence that the main cause has been the weakness of the lime and sand we will suppose in our imaginary decorations that we don't fall into this mistake that we get lime of the proper strength and clean granite sand we will also suppose that we don't get a dozen barrels of mortar made up but have our intonaco mixed fresh every other day the first thing to be painted is the sky or background whatever it may be we mark out on the wall with charcoal the extreme extent of this background we don't trace the outline of the heads but make our black mark well beyond where this outline should be the plasterer ought to be an early riser so that by nine or ten o'clock when we arrive we may find the mortar all ready for us even in surface and tolerably firm or set as it is called i never could get an english plasterer to throw the mortar against the wall as is done by italian and french workmen when spoken to about it he always seemed to think he ought to know his own trade best or perhaps the union forbids him to make the mortar stick too close his way of smearing or buttering the wall answers pretty well on a very rough surface but on smooth stone or tiles it would not do at all in italy it is not at all uncommon to see marble columns decorated with frescoes more than four hundred years old the intonaco in these cases is very thin not above one-eighth of an inch in thickness as a rule the thinner the intonaco the better it will stick we will suppose now that we have painted our flat background and finished our first day's work we now get our pricked tracing and holding it so as to fit the panel we apply our charcoal bag to the outline of the heads when we remove the tracing paper we find a black dotted line which gives us the outline against the sky with a knife or a sharp spatule we cut away the superfluous mortar the cut should not be at right angles with the wall or the outline will be sure to be injured next day when the fresh mortar is joined on to it it should be inclined at an angle of fifty or sixty degrees i always make a point of doing this cutting job myself the dotted line is sometimes indistinct and i have to cast a glance at the cartoon where therefore there is any complication of outline or the least indistinctness this operation ought to be done by the artist before leaving we make a charcoal mark as before which will completely cover our next day's work and leave us a remnant to cut away our plasterer fits in the new mortar up to the charcoal mark the next morning and so we proceed bit by bit as if we were putting together a puzzle until the whole is completed it is hardly necessary to say that it is very desirable that each cutting should correspond with some natural division of the work thus in painting a female head we might paint the hair and diadem the first day and go on with the face and neck the next stopping at the necklace in real fresco nothing can be retouched every day's work must be finished and complete in the minutest detail i will now say something about the colours and execution of fresco in fresco as in distemper the colours in drying become of a much lighter shade it is therefore very desirable to have a piece of some very absorbent material at hand to try the tents on there are two distinct modes of painting fresco 
one is the solid body color method as practiced by michelangelo raphael and all the other masters of that period the other is the thin watercolor method if we adopt the first mode we get a porcelain or metal palette and set the colors on it just as we do for oil painting lime takes the place of white lead the only yellow it is safe to use at least in england is raw sienna probably however mars yellow which is derived from iron might be used with safety light red of various kinds and burnt sienna are the principal reds oxide of chromium is the green raw and burnt umber are quite safe as is also black blue is a very difficult color to manage in fresco it seems very antagonistic to lime and it is almost impossible to paint a blue sky properly graduated on the other hand raw umber takes very kindly to fresco lakes and all vegetable colors are to be strictly avoided the brushes ought to be hog's hair tools but long and soft so as not to disturb the surface of the wet mortar painting fresco in this opaque solid method is a very similar process to oil painting it is best to begin with the shades and work up to the lights no scrumbling is practicable but at the end of the day when the surface is becoming too dry for solid painting thin washes of color may be used with great advantage the italian terra rosa burnt sienna raw sienna and even vermilion may be of great service for these light glazings it will take three or four days and often more if the tonico is thick and the weather cool before the colors begin to lose their dark wet tint the beginner must not be discouraged if the colors seem to be drying not as he intended some colors take a longer time than others and it is well to have a little patience the old masters generally retouch defective parts with what was called fresco secco dry fresco but which was simply some compound of white of egg vinegar and garlic but it is much better to cut the defective portions out to have fresh intonaco laid on and to repaint them if once you begin to retouch the whole work seems to require it and you never know where to stop the second method of painting fresco is totally different i very much prefer it as the work is done more rapidly and the colors hardly change at all in drying besides as far as my experience goes the result is more durable as soon as the fresh intonaco for the day's work is sufficiently set you mix some lime with water very fluid something like milk good milk i mean and not milk and water you float this over the intonaco and in about ten minutes you may give it a second coating of lime water this ought to smooth the surface and remove any little grains of sand you now trace your outline as before with the tracing paper and the bag of charcoal you have no palette but half a dozen small tumblers into one of these you put a small lump of raw umber and about the same quantity of oxide of chromium you add water and mix them well together the result is of course a brownish olive green you pour half the mixture into another tumbler and add water thus getting a weaker solution of the same mixture you repeat the process into a third tumbler and get a still weaker tint with these three or more tents you begin to model your head beginning with the dark parts and working up to the light you must bear in mind that no rubbing out is possible you cannot wash or sponge out as in watercolor drawing you must therefore be very careful in approaching the light parts and copy the cartoon as carefully as possible you continue thus to draw and model with your green color until the head looks like a finished drawing this operation will take from two to four hours according to the nature of the head you now take three clean tumblers and put a small lump of light red or terra rosa into one of them add water and mix as before you make weaker solutions just as you did with the green if the head is that of an old man or a bronzed warrior you ought to add raw sienna to the light red but for ordinary complexions the light red is quite sufficient you apply this flesh tint in washes with a very broad and soft brush using the stronger solution for the lips and cheeks the medium for the intermediate parts and the weakest for the highlights no modeling is required the modeling has already been done and this tinting is very soon accomplished 
you now take either burnt sienna pure or burnt sienna and umber and with a fine sable give strength and precision to the darkest parts such as the nostrils the division of the lips the inside of the ears etc if a little black is necessary for the eyebrow or eyelashes you now give these little finishing touches and your head is complete you have not used one grain of lime or any solid colour the wall is stained rather than painted and you have none of those strange and capricious changes of colour to fear which are so constantly occurring in the solid method where lime is used freely as a pigment i have now gone through the whole process of fresco painting as far as i know it i shall conclude with a few general observations the fresco painter ought to be of a nature capable of continued exertion whatever the work is whether head torso or drapery it must be finished in a day he must not on the plea of headache or seediness give himself a half holiday he may of course abstain from work for a whole day or for a week if he likes but those little snatches of rest involving a game at lawn tennis a good lunch or a look at the papers to which many artists are rather partial are denied him he is always working against time and although this is trying at first he soon gets accustomed to it secondly he must be a man of fixed purpose he has got his cartoon and his coloured sketch and he must turn a deaf ear to all suggestions of alterations when once these preliminaries are settled an alteration in the turn or size of a head or a change in the action of a figure are very easily carried out in an oil picture but in a fresco it is very serious matter to begin alterations thirdly he must not mind a bit what the workmen and people about the building think of him i believe that the upper ten thousand at least the aesthetically inclined amongst them do not hold mural decoration in contempt but the working class invariably takes the fresco painter in his blouse and on his scaffold to be one of their own fraternity if they were to see the same artist in a handsome studio painting somebody's portrait in a gilt frame they would at once suppose he was a gentleman but colouring a wall is a very ungentlemanly occupation when i was painting a large monochrome work at university hall there were some plumbers and glaziers employed in repairing gas pipes and mending windows one of them came down into the hall where i was at work and began to look about for something amongst the pots and colours on my table apparently he did not find what he wanted so he turned round and called to me i say governor you don't happen to have a bit of putty in your pocket fourthly and finally the mural painter ought to be satisfied with moderate pay at the tercentenary rubens festival celebrated at antwerp last year an art congress was held at which i assisted the principal question proposed for discussion was an eminently practical one it was how can monumental and decorative paintings be best encouraged and revived at the present time in answer to this practical question i gave what i thought a practical answer after passing in review various difficulties with which modern artists had to contend i summed up by saying that the real impediment to the development of mural painting was its enormous cost and i pointed out that it was only by the artist accepting very moderate pay and having at his command a staff of efficient pupils who would be willing to work under him for little or no remuneration that such works as were executed in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries could again become common i said a good deal respecting the costliness of large mural paintings done by modern artists of any repute and on the other hand gave examples of modern work which with the help of efficient assistance had been done not only well but at a moderate cost at the conclusion of my paper up jumped a gifted orator who knew no more about painting than a cobbler and in a torrent of eloquence swept away the few grains of common sense i had ventured to impart into the congress it was a sacrilege according to him to profane the temple of high art with a dirty question of pounds shillings and pence art was a subtle essence a delicate perfume art was a religion art appealed to all our higher sympathies and it was only by educating people up to a kind of art millennium pitch that we could hope to see our public buildings decorated with historical paintings 
he sat down and mopped himself amidst loud applause and i felt considerably humiliated we had a great deal more of this sort of thing at the congress the few artists who were present sat dumb and the high aesthetic gentlemen had it all their own way so that the congress which might have served some practical end finished in vapour and smoke in spite however of this termination of the discussion i am still convinced that until mural painters have sufficient love for their art to accept a small remuneration decorative work of a high class will languish for the mural painter's work manchester millionaires do not buy with each other no spirited and enterprising dealers beset his studio eager to secure whatever he has on the easel all of what dr johnson called the potentiality of becoming rich beyond the dreams of avarice is denied him pay of course he must have but his patrons are generally committees or corporate bodies of some kind who seldom give fancy prices let him therefore console himself with the thought that his is the highest and noblest branch of the profession and that whilst high-priced easel pictures are relegated to private galleries and dining-rooms only to reappear at intervals at christie's sales rooms his work is a fixture that can always be seen by the public with the hope that it may be admired as well as seen i shall conclude my lecture End of Lecture 8lecture nine of lectures on painting by edward armitage this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture nine on finish it has always been a disputed point both amongst artists and writers in art how near an approach to absolute truth is desirable in painting some insisting on photographic accuracy whilst others go to the opposite extreme and consider mere suggestiveness to be the great desideratum in painting much may be argued in favour of both sides of the question but a medium course is certainly the best imitation of nature is no doubt the foundation stone of all sound painting and the natural inference would be that the closer the imitation the better the picture but on the other hand a picture which is not an exact counterpart of the object portrayed but leaves something to be imagined is generally more interesting than a more perfect copy would be this fact is particularly noticeable in pictures of flowers fruit and still life generally a picture which at a little distance gives thoroughly the character of the fish game or flowers it is intended to represent will be much more masterly and artistic if the scales of the fish the feathers of the birds and the petals of the flowers are not individually studied with microscopic care but treated in a broad suggestive manner in a painting so handled the loss of a few minute details is more than compensated by greater freshness of colour and the charm inseparable from a rapid and dexterous execution if it were possible to combine the two qualities if we could get breadth and brilliancy united with minute finish it would even then be doubtful whether the picture would be any better for the additional pains bestowed upon it in looking at pictures we require to be deceived only up to a certain point and the whole question depends on where to fix that point in tonight's lecture i intend to investigate this subject and to extend my remarks to other kindred questions connected with the finish of a work of art all writers and lecturers on art are pretty well agreed that excessive finish is undesirable i mean such finish as one sees in bellini's portrait of the doge where each individual hair is painted and where every wrinkle or pimple is studied as though it were of the utmost importance there is however a kind of finish of an infinitely more objectionable kind than bellini's if bellini elaborated small details to an extensive extent they were at any rate thoroughly and honestly studied his minute delicate work always had a laudable object whether it were the exact rendering of a stray hair or the microscopic modelling of the wrinkles about the eyes but the finisher of whom i am now speaking has no object beyond smoothness bad proportions and gross errors in drawing are nothing to him provided he gets a smooth uniform surface like the old-fashioned provincial drawing-master who taught oils water-colours and apuna painting smoothness and finish are with him synonymous terms 
probably most of you are happily ignorant of the lost art of puna painting and drawing and i certainly do not mean to waste our time in describing it it will be sufficient to say that the process was almost entirely mechanical and that the results exhibited the maximum of smoothness combined with the minimum of art it used often to be taught in young ladies schools it would be both invidious and unjust to compare the work of any academy student with these inane productions but i wish to warn you as i have often warned you before against confounding finishing with mere polishing intelligent finishing consists in correcting small faults of detail in revising the relative values of the shades and half-tones in giving definite form to the fingers and toes or any portion of the figure which may have been neglected unintelligent finishing or what i call polishing consists in getting a nice even grain for all the modelling of the figure this polishing process may not in itself be objectionable but it becomes objectionable when it interferes as it too often does with necessary alterations and modifications you probably all know that i am no advocate of sketching in the schools however much i may admire the nude studies of the great masters i do not wish to see the same kind of work attempted by the students i am decidedly for finish high finish even but by the term i mean accuracy of drawing and modelling and not neatness or evenness of execution to return to the doge's portrait which i have taken as a thoroughly good specimen of minute finishing it is perfectly true that if you go close up to it and examine it with a lens you will find it much more like nature than would be a head by titian or rembrandt if subjected to the same microscopic investigation but pictures are not meant to be microscopic objects any more than human beings if in some foreign town i meet unexpectedly my old friend smith i should probably recognize him some fifty yards off i should say that must be smith it is so like his figure and general appearance as i approach him i begin to distinguish his features and i become more and more certain until finally i grasp his hand and all doubt as to his identity vanishes it is smith all over and as i remark not a bit changed since i last saw him i do not pull out a pocket lens and count the number of grey hairs in his whiskers or the small warts about his eyes it appears to me that a life-size portrait should be treated in the same way viewed from the end of the gallery it should resemble the person it represents and the likeness should become more and more striking the nearer we approach until we get within a very short distance if we approach still nearer the brushwork of the artist begins to appear and finally if we examine the features with a lens we can discover but very little left of the resemblance which was so striking at a reasonable distance the whole question is what is a reasonable distance in portraits by the minute finishers the point at which the work looks its best is evidently too near and i think that in a good deal of modern painting it is too far off a life-size head should look its best at from about six to ten feet distance nearer than six feet the impasto and brush touches of the painter would be too apparent and beyond ten feet the delicate modelling of details would begin to be lost artists and the art-loving portion of the public delight no doubt in going close up to a fine titian rembrandt or van dyck but this is to see how the marvellously lifelike effect has been produced to learn a lesson in short but not to view the work from the most favourable standpoint i think it will be found that generally speaking the old masterpieces of portraiture are best seen within the distances i have mentioned there are no doubt exceptions thus the portraits of holbein gain by being studied closely and those of velasquez are best appreciated at a considerable distance whilst the figures of van der helst are so admirably painted that they will bear a very close scrutiny as well as a distant view if an artist has the precision of a holbein or the consummate execution of a van der helst there is no harm in his following finish in portraiture almost to its extreme limit but if not he had better rest and be satisfied with less literal work 
in spite of a few honourable exceptions the tendency of modern artists is however not toward the finish of holbein but rather in the opposite direction no one can walk through a paris exhibition without being struck by the enormous amount of sketchy imperfect work the best specimens of which have at a great distance a look a reminiscence of nature but when viewed nearer resolve themselves into smears of paint generally plastered on with the knife now it is this kind of work which is so attractive to the modern connoisseur the peasant the workman the soldier pass it by with a laugh or sometimes with an expression of bewilderment the cultured artist shrugs his shoulders but tries to view it leniently as he would the work of a savage but the dilettante and those who have a smattering of art knowledge delight in it it flatters their vanity to supplement out of their inner consciousness the artist's shortcomings these pictures get talked about in the salons and praised in the newspapers whilst good honest sober work is comparatively ignored public taste having thus declared itself it is not surprising that an ever-increasing crop of these young impressionists should be forthcoming to minister unto it there is another kind of departure from truth in connection with finish which is i think almost as much to be deprecated i mean where the heads are painted in a different style to the rest of the picture if we go back to the old masters we shall never find this fault examine any of their works recall to mind the raphaels the titians the correggios or the poussins of the national gallery and observe that the draperies accessories and backgrounds are all in keeping with the heads if as in perugino's and raphael's early works the painting of the flesh is delicate and smooth though dry and hard you will find the same qualities and defects in the whole picture if on the other hand as in titian and paul veronese the flesh painting is rich and free the draperies will be equally so take rubens again how homogeneous is his work let us suppose that a picture by this master were unexpectedly discovered and that by some accident all the flesh painting in it had been destroyed would any one hesitate on inspection of what remained in attributing it to rubens would not the good and bad qualities of the master be apparent in every part as the opposite extreme to the slapdash rubens take the careful gerard dow and observe how the delicate and minute finish of the heads is carried out into every detail of his pictures if we examine any genuine work of rembrandt or of david denier we shall always find the same homogeneous qualities the heads may as is often the case in rembrandt be more carefully painted than the unimportant parts of the picture or contrariwise as in david tenier we may sometimes find a stoneware flagon more elaborated than the hand of the boor who is holding it but we recognize everywhere the touch of the master i know of no example amongst the old masters where the kind of disparity in style which i am deprecating is observable in certain modern pictures however this homogeneous quality in painting is sadly wanting in the so-called spanish school by which i mean the school of fortuny the background draperies and accessories are painted with a crisp dexterity which is quite marvellous whilst the heads are laboured like coloured photographs the contrast is sometimes so great that it is difficult to believe that the picture is not the work of two artists this fault has become apparent in certain pictures of the austrian school but the contagion does not appear to have extended to us at least not to our oil painters i have however noticed a tendency amongst a few of our watercolour figure painters toward this singular modern peculiarity the difficulties of giving colour form and expression to a head and at the same time preserving a free style of painting are no doubt much greater in water-colour than in oil but i think it so desirable that a work should be homogeneous that i would sacrifice a good deal in the way of finish and even of expression in the faces to obtain that quality if a man has great versatility with his brush and wishes to display it let him paint one picture in the style of holbein or memling and another in the style of velasquez but he should not in the same picture and a fortiori in the same figure attempt to unite two dissimilar styles of painting one of the principal difficulties young artists have to encounter in finishing a figure picture is the management of their drapery 
if they are painstaking and make an intelligent use of their models they will succeed with their heads hands and all their flesh painting or if they do not succeed the way to success is so obvious that i need say but little about it i assume that our young artist has gone through a course of study and is able to paint a nude figure or a head from nature tolerably correctly his difficulty will be not in copying his models but in making use of them without copying them he should form an ideal in his mind of the personage he means to represent and take care to select either from professional models or from his friends those who approach nearest to this ideal he will probably have to make use of casts the small heads of the warriors on the trajan column are admirable in character and very suggestive casts from the medieval heads of pisano donatello and luca della robbia are also very useful all these and other means towards his end will suggest themselves to him but his course is not so clear when he comes to tackle his draperies every student must be aware that draperies adjusted on the lay figure and carefully copied have always an unnatural and trivial look about them the form underneath if expressed at all is the form of the lay figure and not that of nature it will not do therefore in a picture to adjust the drapery on a lay figure and copy the result this may be done with advantage for those folds which hang altogether independent of the figure but for all those which are in the slightest degree connected with the form underneath some other method must be adopted no doubt the best method of all were it possible would be to dress up the living model and paint direct on to the picture but this is seldom practicable long before the artist has had time to study the folds the model moves and all has to be done over again if an artist has great experience with drapery and the attitude is a very easy one he may make a charcoal study which will serve him for the picture without having subsequently to readjust his drapery on the lay figure but no young hand would be able to do this in a satisfactory way he must go more systematically to work he must first get a characteristic study of the nude figure i mean such a study as the old masters used to make giving the exact attitude and the form of the salient parts he must then make a replica in charcoal of this study and adjust the drapery on his living model on this replica he will now as far as he can reproduce the arrangement of the folds he has before him there are plenty of studies by raphael and the old masters which explain better than words can the process i am trying to describe he has now two working drawings to guide him viz his original nude study and the study from the draped model having thus as it were laid his foundations he may drape his lay figure and paint directly from it on to his picture taking care as he proceeds to correct the form from his preliminary studies he will thus be doing sound honest work and even if dissatisfied with his finished drapery he has always his studies to fall back upon some artists especially french and italians make a great use of photography and if kept within bounds i see no objection whatever to the practice it would hardly be legitimate art to dress up and pose a number of models and have them photographed with the intention of transferring the group to canvas but it is perfectly allowable to call in the aid of photography for draperies or costumes where from the action of the figures it would be impractical to draw the folds from nature all portrait painters know that it is not easy to get ladies and gentlemen to sit for their clothes and it is far better to get help from a good photograph than from a model or a lay figure whom the clothes do not fit i have no doubt that if photography had been known in the time of raphael he would have largely availed himself of it he often copied whole figures from his predecessors and this is certainly more reprehensible i now approach the vexed question as to how far the draperies background and accessory parts of a picture should be finished without distracting from the heads most of you will doubtless recollect the passage in sir joshua's discourses where speaking of drapery he says it is the inferior style that marks the variety of stuffs with the historical painter the clothing is neither woolen nor linen nor silk nor satin nor velvet it is drapery nothing more 
i would fain believe that sir joshua meant to say that it was beneath the dignity of high art to trouble itself with surface texture in which case i should certainly agree with him but i am afraid this is hardly what he did mean however that may be it is certainly not the inferior style which by intelligent arrangement and careful study of the folds expresses the nature and quality of the various stuffs how is it possible using sir joshua's own words to dispose the drapery with the nicest judgment and to copy it carefully without clearly expressing the material out of which it is made satin and velvet are very seldom wanted in pictures of subjects taken from the bible ancient history or mythology the figure should be clothed in woollen or linen stuffs and without descending to minute imitation of texture the nature of these garments should be clearly expressed if in raphael's frescoes and in the works of the roman school generally we are in doubt as to whether the draperies are meant for wool linen or silk it is because their folds were not studied with the greatest care and often not disposed with the nicest judgment in many of raphael's works and particularly in those of giulio romano we feel that the draperies are wholly imaginary and hence the vague uncertainty as to the material this uncertainty instead of being a quality to be imitated appears to me as a blemish to be avoided in the highest style of landscape painting again although it would doubtless be absurd for the artist to elaborate his foliage leaf by leaf yet there would be nothing beneath the dignity of his art in faithfully giving the general characteristics of the oak the beech the ash the bay and the olive so that each species should be distinctly recognized in the picture i am quite aware that in many classical landscapes by poussin and the old masters it is difficult to specify the kind of trees they contain but the botanical uncertainty in which we are left instead of enhancing the merit of the work rather lessens it i remember going through an italian gallery with a mixed company and coming upon a magnificent titianesque landscape this arrested the attention of all the party and was greatly admired until some botanical philistine asked what kind of trees the artist had meant to represent we none of us could tell i thought they were evergreen oaks another said they were elms a third apple trees and so on but we were all in doubt well says the questioner it cannot be much of a picture if the trees are done so badly that no one can tell what they are our philistine was no doubt wrong but at the same time the work would have been all the better and would have lost none of its imposing grandeur if the specific characters of the trees had been given with greater care i am glad to note that almost all modern landscape painters are fully alive to the fact that a tree is not merely a tree but a particular species of tree and that the species can be thoroughly indicated without in any way lessening the grand character of the work to return to draperies and costumes the artists of the byzantine and romanesque periods used to paint their heads of a conventional and very ugly type without any attempt at individuality and bestow all their care on the draperies nimbi and accessory parts often enriching their work with real jewels this fashion which was rampant in the byzantine period began to wane in the fourteenth century but lingered on almost till leonardo da vinci's time during what may be called the golden age of art that is from leonardo's time down to Poussin's, the proper balance of finish between flesh and drapery seems to have been well observed but in the last century especially in this country the artists of the time reversed the practice of the old byzantine painters that is they painted the heads of the sitters as well as they could and left the dress and accessories to be put in by their assistants bad as the flesh painting was the treatment of the dress was still more slovenly and inartistic the apologists for this style of work say that the head is everything in a portrait and that no one cares about the dress and background but this was certainly not the opinion of the old masters to take a familiar example is not the head of gavertius greatly improved by the exquisitely painted frill which surrounds it or again is not the lifelike flesh in bordoni's female portrait rendered still more lifelike by the gorgeous colour and masterly execution of the crimson dress 
our national gallery teems with examples of the same kind where judicious finish of the accessory parts assists rather than mars the effect of the flesh painting i do not wish to be understood as insisting that in all cases the dress and background should be as much finished as the heads but there is a great difference between unfinished work and bad work and it is this difference which the advocates for neglecting accessories seem unable to understand i do not find fault with a certain charming unfinished portrait group by rubens in the louvre because the accessory parts are merely indicated but i should find fault with it if they were clumsily and inartistically painted the kind of work i am protesting against is that which is often noticeable in portraits of the gainsborough and lawrence schools where the shoulders and hands are quite shapeless and the folds of the dress utterly impossible it is very refreshing to me to emerge from a gallery containing pictures of this class and to enter one devoted to pictures of the dutch school i feel as if i had reached terra firma after floundering about in a quagmire we never find a want of intelligent and careful drawing in the hands and dresses of portraits by rembrandt van der heist franz hals terberg and all the other masters of the school it may be objected that i am deprecating a fault which no longer exists that my expressions of antipathy to a slovenly treatment of the accessory parts of a picture are out of date and that the commonplace simpering full lengths of fifty years ago with their impossible shoulders and badly drawn hands are no longer seen in an academy exhibition i am quite willing to grant this but it does not follow that because this pseudo lawrence sort of work is no longer seen on the walls of the academy that therefore it is defunct there is a large and ever-increasing class of young artists who are treading in the footsteps of the old masters who grudge no time and spare no pains in the study of their hands costumes and everything which will give finish and completeness to their work but on the other hand there are still many who to save themselves trouble and perhaps misled by the present extraordinary popularity of gainsborough are satisfied with the most careless and weak treatment of all accessories in their pictures that these pictures are not often seen on the academy walls is due to the rejecting power of the council and not to the non-existence of their authors having thus i trust given you to understand that by the word finish i mean something quite different from mere smoothness or polish i will now give you a few hints as to how the work of finishing a picture is to be accomplished it was the habit of horace vernet to make a very rough pen and ink sketch for his elaborate battle scenes he would then without further preamble have his models and paint direct from them on to the blank canvas finishing everything as he went on when the whole canvas was covered the picture was finished i remember on one occasion he painted a most gorgeous arab saddle holster stirrup and all and several weeks afterward painted the horse which bore it cocked hats kepis etc he would knock off by the dozen and then when he could get his trooper models he would paint the wearers he was always in the matter of finish putting the cart before the horse i don't think that he did this intentionally but he was of an impatient nature and could not bear to sit idle waiting for his sitters he was not a great colorist like his contemporary delacroix nor a great draughtsman like flandrin but his pictures have a manly business-like look about them and a homogeneous quality which is perfectly marvellous considering the heterodox way in which they were put together no living artist and probably none that ever lived could have taken such liberties with his modus operandi without the most disastrous results and i feel sure that no one present here to-night would think of painting a figure picture in this haphazard fashion supposing the subject of the picture to be the time-honoured one of king john signing magna carta instead of like vernet beginning by painting a medieval inkstand and then perhaps doing a bit of tapestry background proceeding onward toward the figures the proper process would be to get the figures done first and finish with the accessory parts i will assume therefore that this has been done that the composition of the groups has been thoroughly studied that a coloured sketch has been made and that each individual figure has been carefully studied from nature the picture however after all this work would probably be far from finished 
the general effect would have to be revised certain portions which had cost hours and even days of labor would have to be sacrificed other important parts such as heads and hands to be altered finally the general scheme of color which was pleasing enough in the sketch but had somehow deteriorated in the picture would have to be attended to a conscientious artist has often great difficulty in knowing when his picture may be called finished some men will carry their striving after perfection too far and waste their time over really trivial details or like penelope be always undoing their previous day's work this is no doubt better than being too easily satisfied but these vacillating artists should recollect that alterations are not always improvements on the whole i think it may be safely said that when the artist has fully carried out on the larger scale the intentions of his sketch his work may be said to be done by the word fully i mean that each figure should be executed in such a way as to give force and pathos to his version of the subject in the designing of hands for instance there are fifty ways to return to our king john of holding a pen he should not hold it as if he were writing yours truly he should betray unwillingness mixed with fear both in his face and his hands the burly barons again should not appear to be inviting their monarch to kindly sign his name their hands ought to express a resolve that he should sign it and in their muscular knotty fingers should be indicated a foreshadowing of the consequences if he refused attention to all these points is what constitutes finish rather than the elaboration of detail my master paul de la roche was a great adept at this dramatic completeness indeed it was this quality alone which earned him his reputation his drawing was sound and correct but nothing more his colour was generally inky and cold but the dramatic force and truthfulness of his figures were quite enough to ensure him a very high place amongst the artists of the nineteenth century when he was painting his well-known napoleon after waterloo he wanted a pair of muddy boots some artists would have thought the mud splashes of no importance whatever and would have daubed them in at random others more careful would have made their model put the boots on and sent him for a walk in the muddy streets but delaroche reflecting that boots are differently splashed after riding to what they are after walking hired a horse and got one of his pupils to don the jack boots and take a good gallop across the plain st denis the boots were splashed to perfection and it did not take the master long to do them full justice intelligent brain work is of a higher order of excellence and contributes more largely toward the completion of a work of art than mere execution i am far from underrating executive skill but the term is rather an elastic one and generally includes good drawing and good colour as well taken in its restricted sense as meaning merely brilliant manual dexterity i hold it to be of but little value of course a certain amount of dexterity is necessary otherwise a fine sense of form could not be adequately expressed if leonardo and raphael had not possessed considerable manipulative skill they could not have produced a last supper and a madonna de santa sisto where would holbein have been if he had not had great precision of touch as well as the keenest perception of form every painter should have sufficient power in his hand to give expression to what he feels but this is not the kind of manual dexterity to which i have said i attach little importance i mean the showy imprudent kind of work of which there are always numerous examples in foreign exhibitions the kind of work which is too common amongst modern italian painters and which seems to be rampant in the austrian capital to return to my subject namely the finishing of a picture i would advise all young artists to beware of making alterations either in the composition or in the scheme of colour of their pictures when they are in an advanced state a very slight change often brings in its wake many others and gets the whole work into a muddle observations about incorrect drawing or faulty proportions are always valuable as these imperfections can be remedied without disturbing the rest of the picture but beware of suggestions which may in any way affect the general scheme of colouring thus if it is suggested to you that a certain mass of white drapery would be better dark 
and you happen to agree with the suggestion do not be in a hurry to carry out the change try the effect with charcoal or watercolor first and if the result does not please you no harm has been done even if it does please you you should make a large allowance for the charm of novelty you have had your picture before your eyes for a long time and the change may be agreeable to you at first sight and yet if you carry it out you may repent of course if you do not agree with the suggestion dismiss it from your minds the man who listens to every piece of advice that is given him will never finish his work you probably all know the story of the artist with many candid friends who got so bewildered by their criticisms that he provided a large piece of chalk and requested each of them to mark the part he desired altered by the end of the day the surface of the picture was like a section of chalk pit a long experience has taught me that nothing ought to be left undone in the hope of retouching the picture on the so-called varnishing days such anticipations are almost always illusory and it does not matter whether you have one or three days for retouching it often happens that one would like to have the picture home again and repaint it but the few changes one has time to make during the purgatorial varnishing time are so trifling that except to the artist himself they do not affect the general appearance of the picture and they often interfere considerably with the rubbing in of medium or some temporary varnish which is generally indispensable for the exhibition of pictures painted with the ordinary materials as the professorship of sculpture is still vacant i am not trespassing on any one's ground if i say a word or two about finish in sculpture in this art even more than in painting excessive smoothness is too often mistaken for high finish the sculptors of the female figure especially are too prone to efface even in the clay details which ought to be carefully preserved and after the figure has been cast in plaster the work of polishing goes on with file and sandpaper until the few touches of nature which had been left are effaced the great mischief however is usually done when the plaster is copied into marble the paid statuary who does this work strives to give still greater roundness to the already smooth and rounded limbs and he generally succeeds too well when the marble is ready for the finishing touches of the sculptor he sometimes endeavours to regain a little of the natural element but generally he consoles himself with the reflection that high art is incompatible with detail and so his venus or nymph leaves his studio for the exhibition or the patron's gallery there to be admired as a model of beautiful carving and of exquisite taste of the former on account of its soft boneless appearance and of the latter because though a nude figure there is no reminiscence of nature about it there is less of this kind of insipid sculpture now than formerly terracotta which as every one knows is the direct impression of the artist's modelling has to a great extent supplanted marble and the smooth pseudo-classical nymphs of forty years ago are rather out of favour french sculptors of the nude have in their horror of smoothness gone into the opposite extreme and thinking to give more realism to their work have adopted a coarse granular style of modelling for their surface texture i question however whether this new fashion at all meets the objection every artist must entertain toward the old style of work even supposing we grant that in nature the skin is of a granular hummocky texture such as we see in the plaster statues by carpeau and his school i cannot allow that anything is gained by this piece of realism carpeau himself was a man of genius and in his work nature though not of a very beautiful kind is apparent everywhere but his imitators like most imitators copy his eccentricities rather than his good qualities the real objection to the work of the canova school of sculpture is not that the surface is unlike the human skin but that unintelligent carving and excessive polishing tend to obliterate all character and individuality of form this objection can only be met by sculptors aiming at a more discriminating perception of form as well as what from want of a better word i may call a more conservative style of execution 
the excellence of the masterpieces of antiquity does not lie either in their smoothness or in their surface texture but in the beauty of their proportions and in the thorough though never obtrusive knowledge of anatomy displayed in the modelling of every part these qualities in sculpture as well as in drawing are what constitutes finish and not mere surface polishing on the one hand or on the other a coarse imitation of the cellular tissue of the skin End of lecture nine.